Excellencies, distinguished guests, thank you for the opportunity to speak at this important forum. I'm going to focus on the energy transition. The World Government Summit has a history of strong messages on the energy transition. It was at this event in 2015 that His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan, uh, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, described the importance of economic diversification as UAE's reserves decline. Middle East and North Africa will soon also be the epicenter of the upcoming climate action discussions with Egypt hosting COP27 and UAE COP28. Clearly, this summit is timely. The MENA region interaction with climate change is extremely complex. Many countries in the region rely on hydrocarbons, which support economic growth and exports, but contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. Countries that import energy and food are also vulnerable, which has been made starkly clear by the recent tragic war in Ukraine. The growth of the region will further complicate these challenges. The population in MENA is projected to double by 2050. Per the current demographic trends, MENA countries will have to create 300 million new jobs. If urgent action is not taken now, many countries may fall behind with serious implications for livelihoods and social stability. From a global perspective, more access to clean energy will be critical for development. 760 million people, many of whom live in the poorest countries, remain without access to electricity. GCC countries are rightfully concerned about the global community's desire to shift away from oil. We need to look for ways to put the power sector on track for sustainable performance and improved service delivery. This will require finding and planning cost-effective, clean energy generation projects, improving efficiency of distribution and retail utilities, and boosting the financial viability through tariff reforms. Private capital can be mobilized to optimize balance sheets of state-owned enterprises and to support climate-smart infrastructure. We also know that economic diversification can be a path to reduce carbon emissions for economies that are currently dependent on oil and gas. And we know how to activate this path through openness to trade, labor and capital mobility, investing in knowledge, and enabling a strong business environment. We are already seeing the GCC countries willing to invest quickly in hydrogen and help move the entire industry down the cost curve. We are witnessing a massive restructuring of the global oil and gas market where the supply flexibility of the GCC will be critical in dampening volatility in coming months. Regional cooperation on energy can bring GCC financing and expertise to the rest of the MENA region. With the current situation in commodity markets, the fiscal bill for fuel subsidies would crowd out many other activities if left unreformed. The case to contain these subsidies while using cash transfers to protect the poor has never been stronger. The region can make uh, major progress through efficiency gains in the transmission and use of energy, including in air conditioning. Many countries also have endowments to become renewable energy powerhouses. The GCC region in particular is home to the lowest price solar energy generation. Alternative energy sources have the potential to replace fossil fuels for the GCC's residential and industrial use, and eventually also in the transportation sector. I thank you once again for the invitation to address this imminent gathering. With these few thoughts, I wish you a successful event and fruitful discussions. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure to be with you today. We gather at a time when the world faces multiple interlinked crises from COVID-19 
to climate change, to conflict, when the urgency of the moment can make it difficult to envision a new normal. The devastation caused by the war in Ukraine is likely to significantly erode near-term global economic prospects. This puts developing countries at risk of falling further behind as COVID-19 recovery efforts had begun to falter. At the World Bank Group, we are supporting developing countries that have been hardest hit to meet immediate needs. But as the opening remarks of this summit by His Excellency Mohammad Gergawi, Minister of Cabinet Affairs, emphasize, the speed of change means governments must be able to keep up with the challenges. Governments and institutions must be fit for purpose and fit for the future to better prevent, prepare, and respond to shocks as well as the challenges ahead. We must therefore look ahead to take the opportunity to help development that is more green, resilient, and inclusive. Just then, you heard David Malpas provide an important component of such a development through a just energy transition. Today, I want to say a few words about institutions and governance systems, which are an essential part of this approach. The pandemic showed us very clearly that institutions matter and good governance has always been at the foundations for development. Bangladesh provides a good example of how government re reforms can help, even during the pandemic. Driven by a strong, sustained commitment by the government, they established an electronic government procurement system, enhanced transparency by making information publicly available, saving around $150 million which could actually be used and to uh, build over 1,500 kilometer of rural roads or 3,000 primary schools. Institutions and systems anticipating future challenges also is key. And I think UAE is another good example where digital learning platforms created many years ago allowed pivoting to online and hybrid learning during the pandemic, leading to uninterrupted schooling. The time is ripe for change in governance and institutions to better enable us to tackle complex global challenges that can only be resolved through collective action. Let me outline three key areas for action that will help us move towards better governance and institutions. First, we must enhance public trust. Our work shows that high levels of integrity, fairness, and openness in institutions are strong predictors of people's trust in governments. Government responsiveness and reliability in delivering public services and anticipating new needs is crucial for boosting trust in institutions. Working with partners and local communities can improve outreach efforts. Rebuilding social contracts will also require governments to increase efficiency, transparency, and accountability, as well as to manage corruption. On the point of openness, leadership, and clear communication to the public during the pandemic serves as important lessons learned uh, in building public trust. Second, we must make greater use of technology and data for decision making. The pandemic accelerated digitization and showed us how data and technology can contribute to better governance, to inform decisions taken by governments, to monitor the implementation and impact of decisions taken, and to correct course as necessary. The pandemic also underscored the need to address the digital divide so that citizens who lack digital access and skills are not left behind. 2.9 billion people still remain offline, and 40% of the developing world are not using the internet. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are rev revolutionizing what is possible. At the World Bank, we are piloting AI-based solutions for procurement and financial management and data analytics to support government systems and monitor high-risk projects. Governments can play and should play an important role in fostering private sector participation in the public sector and harnessing the innovations of tech companies around the world while providing a trusted digital ecosystem and protecting users. Third, we must build the institutions required for risk identification and crisis management. Every government needs to build out its capability of long-range risk forecasting to improve their capacity 
to deal with future crises and challenges. Critical decisions need to be made swiftly as crisis impacts may spread beyond national borders and trigger significant economic, social, and environmental effects. Governments have a significant role to play in strengthening the resilience of their populations, communities, and critical infrastructure networks and systems. Given the potential shocks we are facing, this ranges from strengthening health and surveillance systems, macrofinancial systems, and adaptation, protecting natural resources, and disaster risk management. On climate-related re risks specifically, the increased frequency of droughts, floods, cyclones, and extreme temperatures can lead to large damages and affect food and human security, including in this region. And we know that in OECD and BRIC countries, the damages have been estimated to be around 1.5 trillion uh, over the last decade. New vulnerabilities and interconnections may further exacerbate economic impacts. To tackle these challenges, we need a fundamental shift in risk management and move towards a whole of society effort. This means considering all actions that governments can take at all levels of government in collaboration with the private sector, academic, think tanks, NGOs, and a citizen-based approach. I would just want to quote the Dubai uh, 2020 Expo, one of its themes. It says, connecting minds, creating the future. This is what it's all about. So that we can better assess, prevent, respond, and recover from the effects of extreme events and the key challenges we are facing, as well as to take measures to build resilience. To conclude, resilient recovery and development is not possible in the new normal without First, rebuilding trust in an increasing openness of governance, governments. Second, utilizing technology. And third, improving risk management to build resilient government systems to better prevent, prepare, and resp respond uh, to a crisis as well as challenges ahead. This involves reimagining the government. That's precisely why we launched the Future of Government Initiative at the World Bank, to help developing countries identify the various pathways for that transformation and to accompany them in the journey. Moving forward in these three areas will enable us to navigate the challenges ahead towards achieving green, resilient, and inclusive development, which will benefit the well-being of the peoples of the developing countries and meet the SDGs. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen and excellencies.